Welcome to Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. It's like coffee with an analyst, or it could be whiskey with an analyst reading a spreadsheet, linking crime events, identifying a series, and getting the latest scoop on association news and training. So please don't beat that analyst and join us as we define the law enforcement analysis profession one episode at a time. Thank you for joining me. I hope many aspects of your life are progressing. My name is Jason Elder, and today our guest has 11 years of law enforcement analysis experience. She started as a crime analyst in Fairfax County, Virginia, and moved on to Alexandra PD, where she was promoted to supervisor and eventually technology services division chief. She's worked for Northrop Grumman, LexisNexis, and currently is the marketing director for Cobwebs Technology. She's held an IACA conference committee chair position and was, in fact, the first training committee chair. Please welcome Mary Craig. Mary, how are we doing? Hi, Jason. I'm so happy to be here. I'm really excited to talk to you. I've been listening to your podcast, have heard lots of my former colleagues interviewed, and I'm just really excited to be on here today. Yeah, I I am so excited. I was really nervous on that intro, so I should not be nervous at this point in time doing so many of these, but you have been on my list of people that I wanted on the podcast for so long, and I just didn't know the right time to get you on to the show, and here recently with this year with you getting back into the law enforcement, now you've gotten your feet wet with them, I thought it was a perfect time to bring you on and tell your story and talk about your contributions to the profession. Yeah, I was really excited when you reached out to me. It was funny. I was having beers with Noah Fritz a couple weeks ago, and you came up, and I said, you know, no, what am I going to do to get on that podcast? And he was like, oh, let me talk to Jason. I said, all right, you got to do that. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> and he did, and he did. And I will say this, though, you don't have to wait for me to invite you. If you, a listener, okay. are out there and you want to be on the podcast, please reach out to us at leapodcasts at gmail.com and we'll be happy to get you on to the show because that's a big part of my work is just identifying people and scheduling them. So if people are willing and able to be on the podcast, that makes my job a heck of a lot easier. Absolutely. All right, Mary. First question then, how did you discover the law enforcement analysis profession? That's a really good question. I was thinking about it the other night. So I, I'm going to be honest. I fell into it. <laughs> I um, that a lot. In, in 2000, I was finishing up my master's degree at American University here in Washington, D.C. And, you know, getting master's degree in criminal justice, I always had this thought that I was going to be an attorney. Yeah, I want to be an attorney. I want to put the bad guys away. When I was in college, I attended some pre-law seminars, and it was like a snooze fest. I'm like, huh. when are we going to talk about, like, criminal law, criminal procedure? Like, this is what I want to do. And I decided my senior year, I didn't want to go to law school. So I ended up going to grad school, getting a master's in criminal justice, and moving into my final semester, started looking for jobs. And I really wanted to go the federal route. So I was applying for criminal intelligence analyst positions, research analyst positions. I was applying at the FBI, the DEA. I mean, you name it, every three letter agency in DC I was applying. And this was pre 9 11. So the intel function wasn't what it, you know what it was post 9-11 so there weren't a ton of positions and i went to a career fair at american university I ended up talking to a police officer from arlington county pd and he was like hey you should really start looking at some of these local agencies prince george's county montgomery county fairfax arlington you know they have civilian jobs where it's a great way to get your foot in the door and you can eventually go federal. So I did that. I went home that night. This is December of 1999. Went home that night. The internet, like I didn't have the internet at home at that point. I didn't really <laughs> have a computer. I had an AOL email address. Yep. Yes. <laughs> so I went home and I just started writing down notes. Like I literally took out a paper map. This is 1999. <laughs> and I was like, what counties are around? I was living in Arlington. I'm like, what counties are around me? And I just started writing stuff down, went to AU the next day, got in the computer lab, and I just 
went on the internet and started looking and there was a position at Fairfax County crime analyst. And I'm thinking, oh, it's evidence technician, evidence role. Mm-hmm. Read the description. I'm like, oh my God, literally every line. I'm like, mm, I took a class on that. Mm, I did that in stats. Oh, I know a little bit about this too. So I, I applied and it was funny. I got a phone call like two weeks later. Hi, this is Sergeant Mark Hobson, Fairfax County Police Department. We've got your resume. We're starting a brand new crime analysis unit and we want you to come in and interview. So that was a really long lead up to. Got hired by Fairfax County Police Department. We started February of 2000. There was 10 of us. There were two, or I'm sorry, there were three retired law enforcement officers from Fairfax. And then the rest of us were just 20 something year old civilians, <laughs> several of us coming out of grad school programs. And that was it. That's how I found out about crime analysis. And it was old school crime analysis. Like we were reading cases. We were sitting in a room, reading paper report and learning about the county being driven around on, you know, with an officer, we were doing ride along. And I got to tell you, it was one of the most fun jobs I've ever had. So yeah, that's how I discovered crime analysis. I fell into it almost accidentally and really with a whole lot of luck. All right. So what were the main issues that you were working on back then? So my district was the McLean district, big area for property crimes. If anybody knows Northern Virginia, I had Tyson's Corner Mall in my area. Mm-hmm but also had the CIA in my area. Kind of weird. So a lot of property crimes, a lot of stolen cars, a lot of organized retail theft, and some violent crime, robberies, you know, sex assault, but it was mainly property crimes. So analyzing trends, looking for patterns in the data, you know, there was really no information sharing at the time. So it wasn't like we were coordinating, sharing data with Arlington. It was a lot of picking up the phone. And at this time, you know, our unit really was the one who started regional meetings, you know, reaching out to Arlington, reaching out to Loudoun County. And at the time, Loudoun County was starting a unit. Prince William was starting a unit. It it was kind of weird. It was like 2000 must have been the year everything started kicking off. So, you know, really just property crime. That was the main focus and a lot with Tyson's Corner Mall. Hmm. So as you're starting, I guess, what was the the feeling going in? Because you're brand new, right? The unit's brand new, you're brand new, and you're just trying to absorb everything and find your bearings. Yeah, it was exciting. It was exciting because it was brand new. Mm -hmm. And being brand new, we couldn't do anything wrong, really, (laughs) because, you, you know, like, They'd never seen a weekly report or there'd never been an analyst going to roll call talking about like, oh, hey, yeah, you had a burglar on this street. Did you know that there was four others with a similar MO? I mean, they knew a lot of that and they were all talking about that stuff. But to have somebody who wasn't sworn coming in and talking about that, like knowing their cases, mm-hmm. It it was met with a little bit of resistance. Luckily, my station was pretty open to it. The captain of our station, Bob Callahan, he was very, he had helped hire us, the analyst. He was very aware of crime analysis, and he really was a big proponent. But, you know, it, it was exciting. That's the word that I'll use, because it was new. And we were getting new technology. So I trained on ArcGIS 3.1. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> uh, right? Yes. Uh, right? Like, is that way back machine or what? I was geocoding my own data. Oh, yeah. And my GIS experts will probably cringe when they hear this to the center line. <laughs> <laughs> there was no offsetting or any of that. So, yeah, I mean, it was it was cool. And we got a lot of cool technology technology like we got GIS they, they put a lot of money into us you know they got us trained they sent us to the alpha group training like Steve Gottlieb came in and trained us so I mean most folks don't get that when they're in a new job like I think about my current role I was like dropped into it like here you go you know here just work <laughs> Then it was it, it they were really investing a lot in us and that was really exciting. 
No. So it's funny, geocoding. I, I wonder, that would be a good question to ask somebody that is in the field within the last couple of years and ask right? them that question. Do they know what that word means? Right? Like, I remember, so Tyson's Corner Mall, like I said, was Tyson's Corner Boulevard. <laughs> well, in CAD records, they put Tyson's Corner BLVD, and mm. if you geocode data, you know it needs to be BV. Yep. <laughs> so I remember, like, writing something that, uh, like, a small little script that took it mm -hmm. and changed it from BLVD to BV so that it would yeah. geocode. So yep. there's my way clean. back. Yep. God, you, had to <laughs> you had to clean the data. And then you had to run it through the system to make sure yeah. that the address got put on the map. And to do that, you had to geocode. You had to put yeah. it in geographic information so you could plot it on a map. That's what you had to do. <laughs> there wasn't any automatically lat long assigned to it like all records management systems do now. No. So, no. Oh, man. It was old. Yeah. God, that made me think. <laughs> <laughs> well, three point one. I, I was trying to think. I think I learned Map Info as well, and I think that was six point oh. And I I don't even Listen, know. I learned Map Info too, and I remember having used ArcGIS or ArcGIS three point one for two years, and then going to another job where they used Map Map Info. I was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, we need Esri. Come on here. Yeah. So when you look yeah. back at your time there at Fairfax, mm -hmm. is there mm -hmm. maybe a particular project or a particular achievement that you think about? Not, no, honestly, no. I mm -hmm. mean, I was there two years. It was still so new. I would mm -hmm. say I look back on that I made some really good friendships and some really good professional connections. And I think working there got me to other roles into the future. Also being a county that's one of the largest in the country, has one of the most advanced police forces. I mean, it, Fairfax County really is on the East Coast. It, when you look at county departments, they are one of the top, right? I mean, they have some of the best training. They have a huge budget. They have a great, really well-educated command staff. So, you know, I would say... It, it just, it, it was the perfect jumping off point for where I was going to go. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So let's talk about that transition then to <laughs> Alexandria PD. Yeah. So I left Fairfax and then I actually went and worked at a nonprofit for less than a year. And I realized that nonprofit life just was not for me. And I then went to Alexandria. So Alexandria had an opening. I knew, again, going back to Fairfax, setting me up for success. I knew their crime analyst, Billy Antonucci. I had met him at a regional meeting. I had his email. We had kept in touch. And when I saw this opening at Alexandria, I was like, mm, that's strange. I wonder if Phil's leaving. So again, this is before LinkedIn, this is before, <laughs> you know, text message or whatever. I shot him a, an email and I said, hey, I see this opening. What's going on with Alexandria? I'm interested in applying. And that just started it. And I applied, went in for the interview, and I got the position. And he had been promoted into the division chief role. So he was going to be my boss. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So I worked, so I started with him, and then I progressed into his role. So that was how everything, you know, started with Alexandria, was just having that connection from Fairfax, my time there, reaching out to him, interviewing, and then, you know, getting the position. Okay. So then let's uh, compare and contrast then a little bit, moving mm -hmm. from Fairfax to Alexandria, what do you what do you remember? Huge difference. So my first thing that I remember sitting down at my desk and at Fairfax we had a mainframe. So again, going in the Wayback Machine. <laughs> had a mainframe. It was horrible. I just remember again writing queries. It, it was a nightmare. So hard to pull data out. Everything was paper. Mm -hmm. So at Fairfax, I was entering stuff into an access database, right? I got, to Fair, or I got to Alexandria first day, you know, I go through all my training. First day at my desk, sit down. They're like, here's the records management system, but we know, and at the time it was SunGuard. We know it's not the best, so we've created this other system that extracts all the data. Oh, by the way, we have all of our narratives electronic. 
Oh, by the way, we have every report, everything, arrest records, incident reports, property reports, you name it. It's electronic. It's in the system and it's updated within 12 hours. I almost fell on the floor. <laughs> camera like is this camera what are you talking about wow yeah so that is impressive for that year and this is 2002 yeah there wasn't a lot of police departments that were in that position at that time no 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 not at all not at all and that was the that's what struck me immediately and you know part of the reason is fairfax huge county right lots of bureaucracy huge alexandria smaller city yeah still a lot of bureaucracy you're dealing with local government but they had a very progressive chief so when i was hired the chief was charles samara god rest his soul he passed away just a couple years ago great man visionary he brought in his deputy chief david baker who i'll get to in a little bit um together they had a vision they had both come from dc police department they had a vision they wanted to be top-notch technology department in the country and within about five years of chief samara coming in in my opinion they were there they got in-car reporting by 2001 everything electronic by the end of 2001 so like when 9 11 was happening a lot of these departments were behind the eight ball Mm -hmm. alexandra was not they were they were leaks ahead of everybody else so when i got there that was the biggest thing for me was i didn't have these these technological hurdles to get over Mm -hmm. A lot. And those were the things that, you know, that was really one of the reasons that I left Fairfax was I wanted to do crime analysis. And I was, but I spent four hours of my day doing data entry to be able to get to that point and geocoding data to Mm -hmm. be able to get to that point. Alexandria, I stepped into the door. I could do analysis at 8 a.m. when I sat down, as opposed to one o'clock in the afternoon when I'd finally gotten through entering all the reports. Yeah, that's impressive. And I, when you said that 2002, I'm sure, pretty sure about this. I, I believe that DC Metro was still using pin maps in 2002. Oh, for sure. Oh, yes, they were. Just to put that in, <laughs> just to put that in perspective of yes. what you walk yes. into. So. But that is really impressive. So I think this is a good segue to talk about your analyst badge story now, because I think from the groundwork that you just laid the base, your analyst badge story is developing Comstat there for the department. Yeah. I know a lot of people come on here and they tell their badge story like, oh, this robbery case or this series. My badge story is taking a department that was leading in technology and moving us into being an analytical department. When I was hired, we had great technology, but the department did not embrace crime analysis like it should. We used to have what we called the nine o'clock So all command staff would sit in a room together. They'd read the boards from the day before. Folks would talk about what meetings they had, where they were going, and we were literally out the door at 9.04. There was no real discussion of pattern, series, trends, whatever. We in crime analysis were doing all that. And at this point, you know, 2005, Joe Ryan, little (laughs) name drop right there, There my boy Joe, we hired him from the police foundation. And if you know Joe Ryan, he's a GIS guru. He is one of my favorite people on the planet. Brilliant mind. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant mind. And he and I used to talk on the phone before I hired him. And we would just literally talk crime analysis. Like, what about this? And did you read that? And did you hear this person present? Like, we were dorks. (laughs) So hired him. And around the time that we hired him, Chief Samara was retiring. Chief Baker was competing with another deputy chief for the chief position and something I kept telling him, I'm like, Chief Baker, we need Comstat. We need accountability. We need to change the way that we look at crime analysis, the way that we look at data, the way that we look at trends. We are set up here and we're not maximizing the technology that we have. Chief Baker became chief. One of the reasons he became chief is when he went in front of council and he went through his whole interview process, he kept talking about metrics and metrics-driven policing, geographically 
driven policing, and let me say this too, Alexandria was not, when I was hired for all of their technology that they had, everything that they were doing right, one of the things that they were doing wrong was they were still time-based. So meaning you didn't come in and you work in sector one or you work in sector four, you were just on midnight. And you might work beat 113 on Monday and you might work beat 120 you know, the next day. So you weren't tied to an area. And one of the things that Chief Baker, when he came in, said we need to redistrict because no one had redistricted the beats in like 20 years. If you know Alexandria, it's a small city right outside D.C., but it's a metropolitan city. I mean, it's huge. It's exploded with population, extremely diverse population, and it had not been redistricted. So we redistricted. We went to four sectors. They reorganized their entire staff to be sector-based, so sector-based captains as opposed to like the captain on midnight, the captain on days. It was the sector captain. He was responsible for Sector 1, which was Old Town, 24-7. So the bad story is CompStat, and we called it the Strategic Response System, SRS. And you think CompStat, some people have a really bad taste in their mouth about CompStat. I will say when we started CompStat under Chief Baker, we did it right because we drove the conversation with analysis. And folks were held accountable. And it wasn't just, oh, robberies are up 5%. No, we were really focused on problem-oriented policing, problem locations, you know, problem people, and doing analysis. And the first couple years, I would say the first two years that we were doing SRS, it worked. I mean, I remember this one location, and Joe Ryan might talk about it if he's on, on Holmes Run Parkway. This friggin' address, excuse my language, you might want to cut that out. This address, this guy's always calling the police. Just, and Holmes Run Parkway would always come up, top 10 call for service location. It's an apartment building. It's not a bad apartment building. And we were like, what's going on here? Like, well, finally, going in, realizing this guy, you know, he needed services and that there may have been a problem with his landline connection and just getting in there, getting some services, getting some other stuff with the apartment complex. All of a sudden, it was out of the top 10. It wasn't a problem location anymore. We could dedicate it to a real problem location. So the badge story really is changing the focus of the department, changing the focus of the command staff, integrating crime analysis into everything that we did. I mean, we brought Rana Sampson in. She did a three-day training with our entire command staff on problem-oriented policing. Like, what is it? How do you attack a problem address? How, what What is a problem? What is, you know, what are some of the pop methodologies that we could use? And it was revolutionizing. And there were a lot of folks who were involved in that, captains, deputy chiefs, who have gone on to be chiefs at other departments. And they will say their experience implementing SRS helped set them up for success well into the future. Nice. So with the redistricting, was did that happen first and then you yeah. were developing the CompStat? Yeah. I, I, and, I, uh, well, yeah. I would say a lot of it was happening in concert with each other. So the redistricting was one of the first things that we did. We brought Rana in for some training. We went through a lot of different iterations of what reports should look like. At the same time, Joe and I and one of the deputy chiefs, Hassan Aiden, we flew down to Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. So Matt White, Jamie Rapp, they all met with us because they were kind of the beacon. Like we looked at them. We were like, that's what we want. <laughs> like, <laughs> we want our comp stat to look like theirs. And they were doing a lot with GIS. They were pumping out reports, constantly pumping out maps. We came back. And as this redistricting was going on and we were looking at how we wanted to do reporting and we were doing this problem-oriented policing training, we came back, we met with our GIS guys, this guy, Steve Tozik, who's still in Alexandria, and we showed them this, these reports and they're like, you know what, why would you want to do something static when you can do something dynamic? We can go auto geocode all your calls for service, all your crimes every night, and we can put a mapping module. I mean, get this, 2005, 2006. <laughs> we can put a mapping module 
in the in-car computer, <laughs> and they can map their own crime. I was like, oh, my, oh my God. gosh. <laughs> yes. Wow. So, yeah. I mean, like, all this is going on together. So when I say it revolutionized the police department, you might just think, oh, well, they did ComStat. No. <laughs> we were doing everything. We were putting data in their hands. We were also implementing being able to push all of our bulletins electronically into the police cars electronically. So it was just a lot of stuff that back, I mean, you hear it now, you're like, yeah, whatever, we've been doing this for 10 years. Then it was revolutionary. Yeah, so how much pushback was there from officers? There was some. There was some. I was hoping you would ask about that. We had one lieutenant who ended up retiring. He was the person who just really didn't embrace any of it. He was in investigations and great guy, super smart. I had a great relationship with him, but he didn't think crime analysis had any role in investigations whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And as soon as SRS launched, he put in his retirement paperwork. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know. So I also think something fascinating about the program developed here is it, it is ComStat. It is a version of ComStat, if you want to put it that way. But a unique aspect of this program is that it was analyst led. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I will say that Joe Ryan and Matt Smith really help drive that being accepted into it, it, listen at the time it, alexandria was we were in an off-site location we were not at headquarters and you had administration on one side you had investigations on the other side and the analysts didn't sit with investigations matt and joe finally went and sat with investigations which was huge huge and they really, because they were over there, they had the trust of the investigators. They really drove this with them. So it wasn't just the acceptance by the command staff. It was the acceptance by the investigative staff, the detectives, that we're doing this really to decrease crime. Like this isn't to get the chief name out there, or, you know, to, to make names for ourselves. Like we really were doing this because we believed in it and that it was going to reduce crime. And it did. I mean, Alexandria hit their 40 year low in crime. I want to say that was 2007 and huge decreases between I would say 2005, 2010, and I would put a lot of that on SRS of information sharing and, and analysis driving everything that they did at that, po that police department. So this is Sam, and I want to let you know that it's okay to talk to strangers. Obviously not if you are four or if you're walking alone at night or in the woods. But in general, if you're just out in your day-to-day -day life or you're traveling or whatever, talk to somebody, talk to strangers. It makes you a more interesting person because it gives you more perspective on life. Everyone is walking around with an interesting story. So many people will defy your expectations when you, you see someone and you make certain assumptions about them, whether they're conscious or unconscious. I love the moment when you realize you were wrong. It's a great feeling and I think it makes your life richer in general. You know, if you're too shy, then maybe just read Humans of New York. That might help you to, to understand other people's experiences. But I'm just here to say, don't not talk to strangers. Hi, this is Matthew Smith, and I have a public service announcement. When you are walking in a building and somebody is coming behind you, please hold the door for them. Give them that common courtesy. And at the same time, if somebody is holding the door for you, just say thank you. It just drives me crazy when people don't say thanks. It's, it's one of my pet peeves. And I think if we all just got along and, and said please and thank you, we would get a lot further in this society. Thank you very much. Hi, this is Carolyn Cassidy, and I'd like to give some information to you. We've all watched shows on TV where someone comes home and there's been a break-in. Their house is disrupted and possibly items have been stolen. Someone gets on the phone and calls 911. Help, please come. I've been robbed. Okay, let's clarify this. You have not been robbed. You have been burgled. A robbery is a person-to-person -person crime. A burglary is a property crime. If you are not home, when someone comes in and takes something, from you. You have been burgled. There has not been a robbery. Hashtag, you were burgled, not robbed. We 
you eventually become the technology services division chief. And yeah. so I'm imagining that's analysis, but that records management system data, is that data entry? Is that everything. what that is in charge of? Yeah. So I had records, I had mobile computing, I had for about nine months, I had dispatch. And then I had all technology. So I had desktops, mobile computers, radios, the whole the whole shebang. And really why I wanted to move into that role is because I looked around the United States and there were not many people in those roles that had analytical backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I also knew that we were we were moving off of SunGuard. They were sunsetting our CAD RMS and we thought that that was the perfect time to look at what else was out there. Yeah. So I thought if we're going to shift and we're going to upgrade and we're going to move ahead, I really wanted to be at the helm of that. So I applied. It was a really rigorous. It was probably one of the hardest interviews I think I've ever been through. They were asking me like highly technical questions. And I mean, I prepared for it quite a bit, but I just felt like if we were going to keep moving forward, I, I needed to have a the head seat at that table. And, you know, I was in that role from 2007 through when I left the department in 2011. And, yeah, I went through the, the needs assessment. I got to tell you, that was one of the best experiences just from a career growth standpoint was to go through the evolution of what we needed for a CAD RMS going through the true needs assessment. So what do you have today? What do you need into the future? What's on the market? What's a make or break? What's a nice to have? That was a really great experience. And if there's any, any analysts out there that are really trying to grow their understanding of integrated technology and data, and your department is going to go through a new CAD RMS, you've got to be on that committee because you're going to learn so much. I learned so much just about just about systems and how everything talks to each other. And it, it, was, just, it was a really good experience. And I highly recommend anybody who has an opportunity to do it. Yeah, I, I said the same thing. When I was in Cincinnati, we went through a new RMS and had, I got a little bit of say and suggestions in terms of the RMS, but it was a really long drawn out process. And I don't think they really yeah. necessarily had a steering committee, but that's definitely a good advice to have some input by your analysts for Absolutely. your CAD and records management system. So yeah. I guess before we move on from, from Alexandria and talk about you going to the private sector, there's, there's two thoughts that I have. And what, because when you said it already, you talked about Joe Ryan and you went down to Jacksonville. Do you ever regret that? Because Joe eventually goes to Jacksonville. So I wonder he if he was wined and dined while he was down there kind of thing. Oh, I, be oh, I bet he was. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, so anybody who's ever worked for me, and there's a lot of IACA members who have worked for me, I'm all about growth. So Anybody who's worked for me in my 22-year career, I'm never going to stand in anybody's way. Like, you want to go on to something better, go do you, boo. Like, I just want you to do what's best for your career. And when we came back from that trip, I mean, Joe was definitely, like, he had that little sparkle in his eye, right? Like, ooh. Because, I mean, he was a supervisor. Eventually, when I became the division chief, he was then promoted into the supervisor role for Alexandria. So, you know, I knew what his aspirations were. I knew that he wanted something bigger. And he and I had spoken about that quite a bit. When he was going through the interview process for Jacksonville, I was actually one of his references. I, I totally encouraged him. I said, you know, if the time is right and the opportunity is there, you got to take it. Yeah. And he did. And I'm glad that he did. Yeah, interesting. And the, and the second thought yeah. that I have is is certainly not saying this as a regret, but there was a time when you, I think you had a position open and I was thinking about applying. Yeah. And I, I lived in, that. and I lived in Baltimore and yes. I happened to take a training, I think the week before the application was due. And I, I was like, oh, that commute, that commute killed me. And I decided <laughs> not to apply you know, based on the commute alone. Yeah, and I remember because Matt Smith was with us and he was living in Maryland and yeah. he did that commute all the time. And I want to say you talked to him maybe. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, man, it's terrible. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think even with the, tra even if I would take the train 
you know, public transportation, I think it was yeah, still brutal. like hour, 15 minutes or something one way yeah. or something like that. And then to drive yeah, it, it was, was, was almost two hours or something like that with the DC traffic. Yeah, so you would, yeah, you would have taken the Mark to the, to the, to the Metro and then still yeah. had to walk. I mean, that's yeah. awful. No. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, so interesting stuff there. All right. So let's yeah. move on then to talk about you deciding to leave Alexandria and join Northrop Grumman. Yeah, yeah, that was a hard, well, that was a hard decision. So for folks who I don't know in real life who are listening, 2010 was an awful year. I ended up being diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 34, and that kind of shakes your world, right? So you find out you have an illness that may potentially be terminal, and you kind of step back and go, whoa, (laughs) what am I doing with my life? And in the end of 2009, I had had my son, my first child, my life was chaotic and crazy. And at the same time, Chief Baker ended up leaving Alexandria. So, you know, I was going through hormones. I just lost the absolutely best boss I'd ever had. I loved my chief. And I just really took this diagnosis like this is a wake-up call i have to do something else in my life and i really enjoyed my job with alexandria but for anybody who's had a major illness you know that it really impacts your finances i mean i'm going to be real my husband and i went into some debt from cancer treatment and it was hard and it just changed me and that's all i can say and this, you know, I remember sitting in my coworker Jody Donaldson's office one day, and I was like, "Dude, I, I just like, I think I'm done." <laughs> and he was like, "What do you mean you're done? What do you mean?" <laughs> you know? And I'm like, "I think I'm just done. I think I'm done with Alexandria. Like, we're in debt, and I, I need to make money, and I'm never gonna make money here. I'm not gonna move up, like." You know, you just have these, and I'm sure people have been through this, like you just have these moments and you're like, what am I doing? (laughs) You know, like, what am I doing in my life? So we have this program that we participated in, the law enforcement information exchange, Lynx, and they had an opening. So Lynx, their their engineering company is North of Grumman, and they had an opening, deputy project, project manager, program manager, and one of the women who ran the link program reached out to me and said, would you consider coming to work for Northrop? And I said, what kind of money are we talking about? (laughs) (laughs) And the money was good. It was way better than I was making at Alexandria. So I went there. I worked there for just under two years. And, you know, did I love it? No. (laughs) No. Did it get us out of debt? Absolutely. But I will say it set me up for where I am now. And this might be my theme is everything you do gets you somewhere else. And it, it got, it helped get me where I am today. And it'll probably help me to go where I'm going tomorrow or five years from now. Yeah. So how does it, how did it it get you to Lexus Nexus? How did it get me to Lexus Nexus? So at North, yeah, I was working with a ton of police departments because at the time, Lynx had like a thousand police agencies Mm -hmm. and we were always talking about integrating. So like at the time we were integrating with Bear Analytics, name drop right there, Sean Bear. Yes. We were integrating with them and we, Sean and I had had a meeting. It had led me to talk to Sam Gwynn. Sam Gwynn had just gone to LexisNexis. So she and I both left government like the same time, right? She went to Lexus, I went to Northrop. The two of us ended up talking and yeah, I was telling her a little bit about the Sean Bear stuff. And she's like, you know, we've been talking, like, why don't we integrate or do something with you guys with public record? I mean, that's brilliant. Let's do it. Ended up talking to her and his name is escaping me, but ended up talking to him. Long story short, he was like, hey, we have a job open. I didn't want to do what Sam was doing. Sam was traveling. Sam was doing training. She was with clients all the time. She was traveling nonstop. I couldn't do that. I was like a year out from cancer treatment. I was still like, you know, you're, 
a year out from chemo and radiation, you're still kind of in the thick of it. I was still seeing doctors like every month to two months. I was dealing with a ton of post-treatment issues. And I was like, I can't be on the road. Like, What's your son? I, I how, old, how old is your son at this time? He was, he was three. Yeah. Or he, yeah, he was two and a half, three. And mm-hmm. it's, you know, you know, you have two, you yes. know, you know mm-hmm. that age. It's a lot. Mm-hmm. And my husband, and my husband was working in law enforcement and he had crazy hours. I was like, I, I can't, I can't do your job, Sam. Like I would yeah. love it. I can't do it. Mm-hmm. So her boss ended up telling me, well, we have a marketing role, but it's not really marketing. It's like content. So it'd be like writing articles about law enforcement and running this thing called the investigators network, which is going to be like Facebook for investigators. I was like, sign me up. (laughs) So yeah, so that's how I ended up going there was again, knowing people, right? I knew Philly and Snoochie. I knew this Lynx person. I know Sam Gwynn. There we, there you go. Yeah. Now, have you always considered yourself a strong writer? Yeah, okay. definitely. So when I was a kid, I I wrote books. Nice. I mean, books in air quotes. Like, <laughs> I would write stories. Yeah. <laughs> right? I was always right. I, I tell everybody, I'm a horrible speller, but I love to write. Oh, okay. And I'm the exact opposite. I'm a good speller and a horrible writer, so <laughs> we can work together someday, maybe. We make a great pair, right? <laughs> <laughs> So that's interesting, though. So you you end up writing for all this content then and doing the research, using your practical experience is is to then talk about different ideas that possibly could be out there. Yeah. And trying to build, we called it the LexisNexis Investigators Network. And it was originally developed by Tommy Joyce, another name drop right there. He had been the market planner at LexisNexis for law enforcement. It was one of his and his wife, Susan Crandall's brilliant ideas. Let's create like everybody's on Facebook. It's 2012. Everybody's on Facebook to an investigators network, which is like case sharing Facebook privacy. Mm -hmm. And it didn't go anywhere, but I got to write articles for it nonstop. And I got to do some development. Like if I was still an analyst, how would I want to share information? Like, how would I want things organized? How would I, you know, how would I want to communicate with other folks? What would I be willing to share? So it harkened back on everything that I did as an analyst, but it also built on the fact that I like to write and I'm a people person. I like to talk to folks and I communicate and I, I basically, you know, I keep my network and I make sure I stay connected. So yeah, so that was my first job at Lexus. And then I got reorganized a couple times. That's the thing that I, they don't tell you. So anybody who's interested in going private sector, when you go and work for a big company, you're going to get reorganized. And I got reorganized three times. Like my unit was changed. My role was changed. This was, that's just what they do. And at the time, I didn't know that. I was like, oh, my God, am I going to be fired? Does this mean I'm not good? Yeah. You know, they're like, no, no, no. This is just what we do. So I ended up getting reorganized. And I was given a choice. Normally, they, they don't give you a choice. They're like, we're reorganizing you. And now you're doing this. And I was lucky enough. I got reorganized. They were like, listen, do you want to do just public safety marketing. I was like, yes, please sign me up. Yes. That's my, like, yes. Marketing to cops and analysts. Absolutely. So I got reorganized into that role and that I loved that job because I learned a lot about marketing to law enforcement. I learned how to do trade shows. I learned how to write white papers. I learned how to do research. And research meaning like survey research. I learned how to write brochures. I learned how to market small events, customer events. So all the things that you think of that are traditional marketing, I really got to learn and I got to hone my skills. So when I got reorganized into that, it was like the perfect marriage of I know public safety. I'm going to learn marketing. I'm going to learn government marketing. So so it was great. And I did that through 2016. Yeah. So with the marketing, oh, sorry. 
I guess yeah, with, no, no, no. Go before ahead. You, yeah, before you go on, just for with the marketing aspect of of that, some of the skills, can you go into that a little bit more? I'm I'm kind of curious specifically what marketing skills you developed during this time. Sure. So when so while I was doing law enforcement marketing, so I did law enforcement marketing through 2016. Then I ended up shifting to healthcare, which I'll talk about in a second. But so the skills I developed obviously writing, but persuasive writing. So not just writing like, I'm going to tell you about this topic, but understanding who your buyer is. So what's your buyer's pain point? What's going to keep them up at night? How do you talk about a solution to, that's not product pushing? So I learned those skills. I learned how to write persuasively. I learned about event management, which getting into IACA in a little bit, I'll talk about that too, but I learned how to develop an event. So not just like send pens and notebooks and a backdrop to a conference, but I learned how to develop a concept. And at the 2016 IACA conference, if you were there, LexisNexis had a huge booth and we developed it around geography and mapping and the acquisition of their analytics. So I learned how to take a concept and develop it into something tangible that markets and that sells the product. So I learned that. Also, the last thing I learned is I learned how to take sales and work with sales to take what they were saying and put it into marketing speak. So what do they talk to customers about? What do you hear from customers? What are customers struggling with? And then putting it, put it into something marketing speak that helps to sell, help sales close the deal. That's what I learned. Fascinating. Yeah. And then, but then I moved into healthcare marketing. So well, I totally did another, I did a 180. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to go to there, but it, cause I, I find that fascinating because I obviously, I went to the healthcare field as well. So we've, we've followed yeah. that, that path. So it's kind of interesting so far because a lot of what you started out with about studying criminal justice and getting your master's degree, thinking about law school, applying for all yeah. the federal jobs, this has been parallel to me so so sure. far, and we even have the same parallel with the healthcare field. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I'd been at Lexus at that point for four years, and I'd been promoted. Like I said, I've been reorged a couple times. They had an opening over, and it was a promotional opportunity on the healthcare side of the business. And the hiring manager, I love. She, the only way I can describe her, her name is Lisi Feliciano. The only way that I can describe her is she is no nonsense driven, but with Jesus at the helm. Like she <laughs> is, I love her. She had an opening and she worked in healthcare, healthcare marketer. And I called her up and I said, you know, I've been doing trade shows, been doing content, but there's so much more to marketing that I don't know that I want to learn because I really, I loved marketing at that point. Like I loved crime analysis. Like I felt like it was my jam and I was good at it, <laughs> but there was a lot that I didn't know. There's a whole, whole discipline out there called digital marketing. And that was her role. And she wanted to implement analytics. So she had never done analytics on marketing across the board. Like you can report on how many leads you get, how that contributes to pipeline, everything else. But she wanted someone to take every piece of marketing and analyze it holistically. And it was kind of a challenge. I was like, yeah, I'm down for it. Let's do it. I don't know anything about what I'm doing. I'm stepping into something I don't know anything about and I'm ready. And it felt very much like when I started with Fairfax County, like mm -hmm. no idea about crime analysis, never had crime analysis. Let's get in there and do something. I felt that way about this job. So I was in that role for six years and I, God, I learned a lot, learned all about website development, learned all about marketing analytics. I learned about customer relationship management systems. I learned about social media marketing. I learned about remarketing, retargeting. I mean, everything that when you go on Instagram and you scroll and you like something, why you get an ad, you know, the next time you log on, why you get ads when you land in Atlanta that are for an Atlanta, you know, workout studio. I learned all of that. And while that's not a big way that you market to law enforcement, it 
definitely, definitely helped get me to where I am right now. All right. Well, let's, let's talk about that then. You've been with Cobwebs Technologies for how long now? Six months. Six months. So perfect timing. Yeah. So the, so what's, yeah. the, what's the first six months been like? I've been drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been awesome. Yeah, so I started here in January. Allison Sullivan, one of the OGs with mm-hmm. the IACA, she posted something on LinkedIn one day. She posted that they were looking for a marketing person. And, and actually, she wrote on the top of the post, if you know anybody interested, and I commented as a joke, me. <laughs> yeah, haha. And she reached out to me. She was like, would you really be interested? And at the time, you know, I'd been in my role for six years and I'd had a new boss. I liked him, but I was not going to get promoted anytime soon. And I was really looking for the next challenge. So, yeah. So I met with like six different people in the span of, this is like right at the Christmas holidays too. I met with like five or six different people in the span of one week. You know, everybody's like taking PTO and they're trying to schedule me for these meetings. But it just, it, it sounds cheesy, but it felt right. They, you know, they're, they're kind of like a startup, not really. I mean, they've been around a while, but not in North America too long. And I saw a demo. So Allison had given me a demo and I was like, hot damn, <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> This is cool. I could do some cool stuff with this, with marketing. So just like talking to people and seeing the demo, like the gears were turning in my head. I had so many ideas of stuff I wanted to do and it just worked out. I mean, they, they offered me the role and it, it wasn't even, I didn't even need to go and talk to my husband. I was like, okay, yep, yep. Okay. I'll start in two weeks. <laughs> wow. That is yeah. quite a turnaround. So, cause I, yeah. I think it just the, progression of where we started this conversation is, you know, today there is so much data and Mm -hmm. I've talked about it several times on the show is I almost feel that there's too much data and you could spend your whole day in Facebook and and YouTube and Twitter if you wanted to, right? There's just so much data out there that it's hard for analysts or anybody to consume that data. So I, when Allison gave me the demo, I literally, I told her at the very end, she was like, what do you think? I'm like, well, let me pick my jaw up off the ground, first of all. (laughs) So I, we have a blog coming out and not to promote cobweb. That's not what I'm here for, but Uh we have a blog that's coming out next week. And it's something that I've been thinking about quite a while. I think about in 2002, 2003, 2004, you know, you get those contact cards and some would be paper with Alexandria. They were electronic, but you get that contact card and it's like that piece of information. You're like, hot damn, I knew that guy hung out there. Or like, I knew that, I knew that they hung together, right? It was like, I got it. You see Cobweb's tool. I think about that from 20 years ago. Think about everything that's done electronically. It's like that one contact card that you got on steroids <laughs> right now. It is because everybody's checking in with each other. They're tagging each other. They're they're online together. They're you know going live together. They're doing whatever, and it's all there. And it can be mined. It's open source intelligence, mm-hmm. and it's it's oftentimes it's the missing piece in the puzzle. And what was that really amazing contact card that put those two people together at that location 20 years ago? It's the same thing, but it's magnified now. Interesting. Hmm. So then your the the name of your publication that's about to come out? Oh, it's our blog. I'll share it on LinkedIn, but it's okay. on cobwebs.com backslash blogs. Allison's one of our regular writers. John O'Hare writes for us as well. Sally Rawlings writes for us. So name dropping some ICA OGs right there. There you go. Yes. All right. Well, very good. Well, you've done a really good job. You helped me out a lot with all these segues. So let's talk about IACA. So (laughs) I don't even know why I'm here, actually. So, but you're ridiculous. 
<laughs> but anyway, no, I, I I thought about it when when Noah reached out to me, and he, it's not like he had to talk me into having you on the show at all. But I was I I thought I was like, man, in terms of the IACA, I mean, Mary <laughs> Mary's really influential to, to the point where it's you know most people probably that have just been around the last couple of years aren't aware of you, but you've had you had quite an influence on the IACA with both the, the committees and the people that you interacted with during your time. Oh, I loved the IACA. I yeah. mean, I love the IACA still. But yeah, I mean, I got involved. I became a member in 2001 when, when I was at Fairfax. That was another cool thing that they did for us. They were like, and we all got you guys membership into this thing <laughs> called the International <laughs> Association of Crime Analysts. I had to go and look it up. I was like, oh, there's even an association. For us, how? But I didn't go to my first conference till 2003. I was supposed to go in 2001. That didn't happen because of 9/11, because I think the conference was literally like the next week. I didn't go. I think they still had the conference, but we they they canceled us from going. And then 2002, I didn't go because I had just started with Alexandria, and I didn't really think it was appropriate for me to ask to go to Orlando. I think it was that year. Mm. So my first conference was 2003. Wow. And then the only year I missed was when I had my son in 2009. Oh, man. So, yeah. Yeah. So do you have a favorite conference? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I would – I got to think. Hang on. It was 2000 – it was the one in St. Pete Beach. This is crazy. What year was that? It's, I think it was like 2008. Was it? Yeah. I think it was, was like 2008. Yeah. And, and what's crazy about that, that's my favorite one as well. Is it really? Yes. <laughs> I and... love that print. <laughs> oh, yeah. And why am I dropping There was this? a lot of car- there was a lot of karaoke. Yeah. Well, that was the first I remember... I'm pretty sure that was the first time, right? Cuz I think we was had it... it in that little that little shack. Yes, and I have photos of Stacy Belladin yeah. like belting out tunes with Sam Gwynn and with Albert Mesa yes. like her backup Singers. Yes. I have those photos. Yeah, and, and that's Albert's favorite conference as well, because he says that's the first. That was the last one where he didn't have to do anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I love that conference. That that was the conference when I actually like really started becoming friends with Allison Sullivan. Really got to know Albert Mesa. That like, I mean, I, I was obviously friendly with them, friends with them, but like really, really connected. That yeah. conference. Yeah, because I think that conference, that hotel, we basically owned. It was small enough that oh, wow. everybody that was there was staying there at the time was from the was from the conference. And oh, yeah. being in St. Pete, you know, the sunset right over the ocean. And it's gorgeous. Oh, I remember watching it from my watching it from my from my balcony. Yeah. I was like, it doesn't get any better than this. Fantastic. It didn't. It's it seemed like it didn't, the sun didn't set until 11 o'clock. It probably wasn't that, but it seemed like it was so late that the actual sun set and it was just Well, fantastic. we may have had too many beers and lost track of time. <laughs> That's true, too. So <laughs> I guess during your time with IACA, and when you think back of, of it, what's some good memories that you have or things that you were able to accomplish? So I would say, oh, gosh, there's so much. So I... I loved that I got to co-chair the conference five with Lynn Brewer. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of fun doing that. It was in Arlington, Virginia at the time. That I I would say, obviously, chairing a conference is, oh, my God. Like, I I think that that was my whole life for three months. Like, I was (laughs) like, bye, Alexandria. I know I work for you, but (laughs) you pay my salary. It's not going to seem like it. (laughs) Right, but I'm working for IZA right now. I would say chairing that conference and then just getting the training committee off the ground, like that was a huge undertaking. It, you know, it was it was a lot of paper based people faxing <laughs> registrations to me or emailing yeah. them. Nothing was electron well not electronic, but nothing was really automated at the time. I worked a lot with Chris Bruce and Susan Whitford on that. So it was really nice to be able to, you know, to work with them, getting it off the ground. I remember the first training we did, it was, I want to say it was Fundamentals, and it was Debbie Osborne who did it. Oh, okay. Um, Nice. Yeah. And, yeah, and then we ran, like, 
Susan did a couple tactical classes. I remember Sally was one of our original trainers. So it it was it was a great experience just learning how to run but work in a nonprofit, you know, like mm-hmm. you're not getting paid, obviously. Yeah. But just like getting something off the ground. It was very it was a lot of work, but it was very fulfilling. Yeah. So I would so. say that, that was the stuff that I really enjoyed. And then just all the folks that I met and I got to work with and just all the people, the friends that I made. Yeah. So yeah, you definitely set the groundwork for Kyle Stoker. Ah. And so he you know, so and I don't know if he's ever gonna leave that role. He is, he just, now he's just, it should just be called Kyle Stoker committee now. You know what? Point. God bless them because yeah, that's yeah. a ton of work. God yeah, bless. And he's done really, really well. That's really grown yeah. under his leadership. And it's yeah. funny. He's, so he's the designated survivor because he's <laughs> the longest running member currently for the, that's a committee lead. So if the whole executive board can't perform their duty, Kyle steps in. He is a designated survivor. That's funny. I didn't even think of it. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. So that was, I think, just written into the bylaws recently. So recently. Wow. But anyway, and then anything else that you want to say about the ISCA? Yeah. I mean, the last conference I went to, I guess, was 2016. And when I moved into the healthcare marketing role, I mean, I didn't get to go anymore, which is a bummer. I'm trying to get to go in my cobwebs role. But I would say just, you know, ICA was great in that I've made some of my closest friends through ICA. Folks I really love through the organization. I got to go and see some great cities. Look, I traveled across the West Coast with Chris Bruce and John Chapman before the 2007 conference. I mean, got to do fun stuff like that. Just have met a ton of people who still come and drink beers in my pool, Noah Fritz, <laughs> on a Friday night. You know, I mean, Joe Ryan. I mean, I still call him up and he's st- he's working at Lexus now. But yeah, I mean, just the connections that you make through that organization, I really feel are connections for a lifetime. All right. I feel very blessed to have been a part of the organization. All right, Mary, so just a couple more questions. What advice do you have for our listeners? My advice is get connected. So talk to everybody. Go to the conference. Talk to folks at your police department. Reach out. Just be connected. You know, back in the day, we had the paper Rolodex. Now we have the contacts in our iPhones. Get connected to folks. Stay connected to folks. You never know what that connection is going to lead to in the future. Every single job that I have gotten has been because of a connection. And it will take you through your career. It will take you through life. Stay connected. Keep good, solid relationships with people. You never know where it will lead you to. All right. Excellent, then. And then we're just going to go into words to the world, then. And so this is, I give the guest the last word, and you can promote any idea that you wish. Mary, what are your words to the world? My world, my words to the world are life is short, and you never know what life is going to throw at you. Life is too short. Don't stay in something you don't want to do anymore. Go and explore. Take that vacation. Go be with your family. Push away from your desk at five o'clock, turn off your computer and go have a drink with a friend. Life is too short. Very good. What I leave everyone with you giving me just enough to talk bad about you later. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> but I do appreciate you being on the show, Mary. Thank you so much and you be safe. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, Jason.